Uh, I do have a quiz, but we're going to do that at the end of class. <clears throat> it's not going to help, I don't think, doing it at the end of class because the quiz is all over. Yeah, it's, pretty, it's all over Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, I mean, there's a couple things that talking about uh, Two Towers will help. <coughs> Might have a quiz on. I'll, I'll tell you for sure, maybe at the end of class. But uh, if we finish two towers today, good chance we're gonna have a quiz on Tuesday over two towers. Even if we don't finish today, there's a good chance we'll have one because we'll finish it definitely on Tuesday. Um, I want to pick up with somebody mentioned last time. I think it was Camille mentioned last time that in those videos I sent you where I asked how many of you watched, and I think it was like three and a half of you watched. Um, I think it ended with the, the chapter, The King of the Golden Hall. That is, I didn't talk about that chapter. If you would, definitely go back and at least watch that last one where I talk about the beginning of The Two Towers, in the, especially the chapter, The Riders of Rowan, because it's really important in that I really want to talk about it today, but we can't. Um, it's important because of the whole emphasis on legend and myth and story and how the shadow of the past kind of reverberates into today. Um, because of what Aragorn says there about legends and, and all that kind of stuff and how he's a walking, living legend, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I kind of make the point. And, and this, this works, because it, it does lead into today. Um, who would Aragorn be in our world? Or who would he be akin to in our world? Probably the son of some famous politician. No. King Arthur. King Arthur. He's Arthur. T.H. White wrote a book, wrote a book called The Once and Future King. Okay, he's modeled on the idea of Arthur. It, actually, the idea goes even back before Arthur, but he's modeled on the idea of Arthur. He's modeled on the idea of another king who is looked forward to, who, according to some people, has come, and according to another group, hasn't yet come. Christ. According to Jews, the Messiah has come. According to Christians, the Messiah has come and gone and will come again, kind of a thing. The future king, the return of the king. Because when this novel begins, there hasn't been a king for over a thousand years. How long has Arthur been dead? If Arthur was real, when did Arthur die? Mid fifth century. Okay, that's about 1500 years from now. So what would, you know, Aragorn's sword, what would Aragorn's sword be if he had Excalibur? Imagine, just for a moment, just, you know, just thought experiment. Imagine some archaeologist is digging up over in the west of England, meaning Wales, or maybe the north of England, because depending upon the Arthurian version, Arthur either, either comes from Wales, or he comes from Cornwall, or he comes from southern Scotland. One of those three big areas, okay? But imagine some scholars digging up over there, and he pulls a sword out of the ground, and it's broken, partially, but they can read either in runic inscription or in Roman uncial letters, Excalibur. What would that immediately do? Immediately, first of all, it'd be on all the major names. It'd be... Impeachment would be so far down on the list, you know, because what would that mean? It's real. He was real. About 20, 30 years ago, I can't remember which, somewhere in that time frame, it's after I started at MTSU, a piece of slate was discovered in Wales that had this, and then the rest of it was broken off, and that arc. Broken Rex. 
Then scholars were like, what? Like Arcturus? What? Arthur King? Okay. Don't know. Don't know if that's what it actually was. Anyways, so watch that video. So we're going to pick up with the chapter King of the Golden Hall. Okay. So Gandalf's back, right? Gandalf's back from the dead. He's told them what happened. He told them he, he strayed far from thought and time, which really means he, he died. He, he wasn't like, you know, um, the Dread Pirate Roberts who was mostly dead. He was, he was fully, completely dead, dead. There wasn't a miracle match to, to bring him back, okay? Because to go outside time means to be eternal outside, okay? So that's dead. Because when you're dead, you're <coughs> gone. And then he was sent back for a time, okay? So they make their way to Medusel. And I'm going to give you a, kind of a, a crash introduction a bit into Old English, which was Tolkien's major area of study. It's what he taught at Oxford University, at Pembroke College, and at Merton College, okay? Medusel, which is where Theoden rules as king, okay? Medusel, and then we have King Theoden. Medusel is Old English, that is Anglo-Saxon. The language spoken in what today we call England, what used to be called Britain, from about 500 to 11, 1130 or so. Medu is Mead. Seld is Hall. Mead Hall. All right? King Theoden. King comes from Old English. Kuning, King. Theoden? It also means king. King, king. All right? So he's the king king. So they're making their way there, and they come across these, these mounds, right? We've already seen these kind of mounds earlier in Fellowship of the Ring, right? They get rescued by Tom Bombadil, rescued from the, from the um, old man Willow. Tom Bombadil has them in his house. Definitely, you know, watch that video, because Tom Bombadil is totally cool, but he doesn't belong in Middle Earth. He's not, he's not a Middle Earth character. Tolkien has already written stories about him, and he just drops them in, okay? But he, they leave Tom Bombadil's house, and he tells them, beware the Barrow Downs. So when you go to, come to this place, and you find these big mounds with a stone standing in them, go around them. And what do they do? They do just the opposite. Right? And so they get captured by a barrel. Tom Bombadil has to then come and um, help them escape. So those are the barrows. So what's a barrow? It's a big grave. What we think of a grave is what? It's a hole you dig in the ground and then you just cover it over. Well, pre-Anglo-Saxon times, and possibly even in some Anglo-Saxon times, in Britain, if the person was important when you would bury them, is you wouldn't dig a hole, you'd put them on the ground and then just raise a big old mound over them. Most important one of these, or most important ones of these, is a site called Sutton Hoo in southeast England in the area of Suffolk. Where in 1939 a grave was discovered in one of these, because the lady who owned the land said, it's got to be burial mounds, let's dig into one, see what's, see what's in there. Okay? So she hires a local archaeologist, and the guy discovers a boat. A 90-foot-long Viking longboat. The boat itself is all gone, but its outline in the sand and the rust from the rivets, it's all there. It's the greatest archaeological discovery in England because of gold and fine jewelry and stuff. Okay, So that's what a barrow is. Go to Stonehenge, take a study abroad course, go to Stonehenge, look at the pretty rocks, and then turn your back to the rocks and look. And at almost every degree of the compass, you'll see barrows. Because this whole, the plains of Wiltshire were one big massive cemetery about 4,000 years ago. Okay? So, they ride all along and they find this, these barrows. And Gandalf and Aragorn talk about them 
and such. <coughs> and Aragorn recites a song. And he says it in the speech of common men, which is English. And we get it there on page 508. Where now the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? Where is the helm and the hauberk and the bright hair flowing? Where is the hand on the harp string and the red fire glowing? Where is the spring, etc., etc.? This is called the ubi sunt motif, which means where are. Peter, Paul, and Mary in the 1960s kind of revived this motif with a song that began, Where have all the flowers gone? Long time falling or long time wasting. The flowers in the Peter, Paul, and Mary version were the young soldiers who had gone off to Vietnam and died. Okay? Tolkien doesn't invent this. Tolkien, as I said, scholar of Anglo-Saxon, Old English. There's a very, very famous Old English poem called The Wanderer, which in one sense is about the futility of war. And Anglo-Saxons celebrated war. They were a heroic warrior society. The poet who writes The Wanderer says, look what it gets you. Six feet of ground. And you have this Ubisoft motif there. This is Old English. Where qua marg, where qua mago, where qua mavim iva, where quam simbla is here to, where sendenciella dreamus, where, 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 where qua merit, that's the horse. Where now the horse and the rider? Where qua mago, where's the warrior? That's the rider. Where qua madum giva, that is the giver of treasure, the lord in Anglo-Saxon society. That's the king's job. See, in Anglo-Saxon society, and we're going to see this expressed because Rohan is thoroughly Anglo-Saxon. Okay? In its behavior, in its manners, in its customs. It's a thoroughly Anglo-Saxon warrior society. Okay? Well, in an Anglo-Saxon society, the king is often called, like in Beowulf, the ring giver or the gold friend. That is, the friend who gives gold. The person who gives rings. Well, why would you give golden rings? Go find a battle for me, and when you come back, assuming you're still alive, I'll give you treasure for it. The treasure I will give you for it is the treasure you bring back to me. See, the way the system worked was, you have your thanes, your warriors, go off fight that battle, defeat the enemy, they bring all the treasure back, they put it at the king's feet, and the king goes, you get this, and you get this, and you get this. It's a reciprocal relationship. You fight for me, I pay you very well. You don't fight for me, you get nothing. In fact, you get ostracized, you get outlawed, etc. So he sings this, and it's a very elegiac portion of the poem. <clears throat> from the word elegy. What's an elegy? Close. It's a lament. Why do you lament something? What do you lament? The loss. It's a loss of something. <coughs> okay? This is a lament over those who have died before. In fact, listen to what Aragorn says. The days have gone down in the west behind the hills into shadow. Let me back up. They have passed like rain on the mountain, like a wind in the meadow. Rain on the mountain, like a wind in the meadow. What do they leave behind? Nothing. The warrior dies, and that's it. The days have gone down in the west, behind the wheels in the shadow. Who shall gather the smoke of the dead wood burning, or behold the flowing years from the sea returning? I mean, is there, is there hope expressed there? No. See, one of the things Peter Jackson does is he adds to the film, he adds this notion that somehow it will all have meaning, that when you die, you'll go to your great reward, whatever debt is not in Tolkien's world. Tolkien's world is thoroughly Middle Earth, thoroughly pagan. This is where it's all at. 
This is what's important. Okay? In terms of what we read in the Lord of the Rings, if you read the Silmarillion, if you read the Lost Road and other writings, if you read some of the things in the history of Middle Earth, yes, Tolkien does bring his Catholic belief system really into it. And I mean really into it. Because he, he has stuff that essentially says all this is kind of forerunner to. It's leading to, it's pointing to the gospel. There will be a new heaven, there will be a new earth, the whole nine yards. I mean, Silmarillion says that death is the gift of men. It's the gift given to us. Why? Because when we die, in Tolkien's cosmology, we leave Middle Earth forever. We go somewhere else. They don't know where. When elves die, they don't. They go off to the halls of Mandos and then they get recycled. It's a pattern of reincarnation. Again and again and again. Because Tolkien says in the drafts, not the actual part that gets published, in the drafts, because I was working on a book on it for a while, of the fairy story essay, the elves, they're tied to this world. And when this world goes away, the elves go away too. That is, when this world is destroyed, you know, kind of second coming of Jesus and all that kind of stuff, the elves will be destroyed also. They, there aren't elves in heaven. Galadriel won't be there. Elrond won't be there, etc. Aragorn will. Beowulf, uh, Baron will, possibly. So, they make their way to the Golden Hall, and they find out about Wormtongue. And that Wormtongue is, you know, Theoden's chief counselor. So they get to the hall, <coughs> and what does the door warden, the guy who guards the door, tell them they have to do before they can go in? Leave your weapons. Why? Yeah, I mean, that's just smart. That's also an old English custom. We see it in the poem Beowulf. Beowulf and all his men, they arrive at Hrothgar's Hall, Hera, and they say, you got to leave all your weapons beside, behind. Why? Because we have other Germanic literature. You put a bunch of jack testosterone jacked up warriors in a room with a bunch of beer, What's going to happen? I'm bigger than you. Mine's bigger than you. I'm stronger than you. Yeah, they kill each other, okay? Which is why there's a line in the poem Beowulf where Beowulf says, I never drunkenly slew my hearth companions. That's, that's kind of a point of pride on his part. I never got in fights with my buddies because I was drunk, okay? So, What is Aragorn being asked to, to leave outside? His sword, Enduriel, Excalibur. Okay, the sword that was broken, that's been reforged. The sword that now, if it's pulled from the sheath that Galadriel had made for it, it will never break. It's not a sword you want to leave with Fred, because you don't know Fred. Okay, but he does. He leaves it with Fred. Legolas leaves his bow and arrow with Fred. Gimli leaves his axe. Gandalf leaves his sword that he took from the Goblin King way back in the Hobbit. Excuse me, that he took from the cave back in the Hobbit. What does Gandalf not leave behind? Yeah. I'm an old man. I got a toothbrush, taffy, a whippers. Fine, I'll sit out here. Thaden can get his sorry. Okay, okay. We'll let you take it out. So he goes in. And what do we see? We get a description. Page. Pages 512, 513. We're inside the hall. The hall's nearly pitch black. And there's a dais at the end. And on the dais is a throne. And on the throne sits a weary old man. Punched over. And beside him, and slightly to the back, stands a drop-dead gorgeous woman, Eowyn, his sister's daughter, so his niece. And on the other side sits a little kind of wiry man, okay? 
And they talk a little bit. And Wormtongue mentions Galadriel as the sorceress of the golden wood. <coughs> what happened last time? Somebody said something negative about Galadriel in Gimli's company. Gimli. Yeah, he says to Elmer, you know, you speak about that which you don't have the wits to even conceive of. In other words, you moron, shut up. <laughs> And Elmer is like, and if you weren't a midget, I would chop your head off and legless steel like, and you'd be dead before you swung. Yeah. And Aragorn's like, well, chill out, man. <laughs> let me, let me, before we kill each other, let's know why we're killing you, okay? And we get, you know, and Elmer's like, oh, so there really is a. And Gimli's like, yes. Why is that so important to Gimli? What does Gandalf tell Gimli when Gandalf returns, when they realize it's Gandalf? Right? He comes and he bears greeting for Aragorn. Tells him what? Don't forget the paths of the dead. And Aragorn's like, Shh. He tells Legolas what? Don't go near the ocean. You hear the sound of the sea and what will happen. You will never be at peace in Middle Earth. Why? Because the elves hear the sound of the ocean. And it awakens in them the, de the desire to go back over the sea to Valinor, which all the elves can do. They can go at any time. Okay? And Gimli's like, shh. Because of the wind tree. He's like, oh, yeah, I forgot, Gimli. What word does he bring to Gimli? Wherever you go, you have the thought of Galadriel with you. And Gimli's like, I hope he's still my heart. <laughs> How do we know? He's like, I hope he's still my heart. Because the narrator tells us Gimli dances and capers a jig. <laughs> like a little Scotsman, you know? He does this little dance. Why? What does that mean? I'm always thinking of you, Gimli. I don't know about you, but I kind of imagine Celeborn sitting back there going, what? What do you mean you're always thinking? He's a midget. Oh, my God. Okay, but that's so Gimli hears that and you don't talk bad about Galadriel. Okay, to Gimli. So, worm tongue, having a worm tongue, a dirty tongue, does. And Gimli you know, paces forward and quotes some poetry and uh, is about to, and Gandalf you know, shuts him up. Gandalf quotes some poetry and says, you don't know what you're talking about. Shut up. Bzz, and zaps him, essentially. Okay? <laughs> and that's why he didn't want him to have the staff. There was a flash as if lightning, page 514, had clove on the roof, and then all was silent. And worm took sprawled on his face. <coughs> okay? Gandalf. Now, Theoden, son of Thingol, will you hearken to me? How old is Theoden? Wild guess. No, he's not 90s. How old is Aragorn? 87. He's 87. 87. If I were 87, I'd be 87. Aragorn's stud. <laughs> but he's 87. Why? Because 87 for Aragorn is like 37 for most of us. Or maybe 27 for you guys. Okay? I'd love to be 37, age wise again, you know. Not everything else. Okay? <laughs> Then he's in his 50s. If you remember, when Aragorn met Elmer, he says, yeah, I know Thandon. I knew Thandon's father. <laughs> I knew your father, too, by the way. He, he wouldn't put up with this nonsense that you're telling me. Come on, kid. He's essentially saying, I knew you when you were in diapers. Go away. So, Gandalf addresses Thandon. Do you ask for help? And what's he do? He lifts his staff and he points to a high window. Because remember, the room is dark. And he points to the window and like somebody you know, presses the remote. And doo -doo -doo, the shade goes up and light shines through. There the darkness seemed to clear and through the opening could be seen high and far a patch of shining sky. Not all is dark. Okay, Put yourself in the scene. You're in a big room. Probably... 
30 or 40 feet wide, 60 to 80 feet long, made of wood, thatched roof, it's dark, it's smoky, because there's a fire burning in the middle of the room, and the smoke goes up and just goes out through a hole in the roof. Okay, Typical Anglo-Saxon hall. But this one has windows along the top of the wall, and one of them is now open. So he says, it's not all dark, but if you look around down here, it's pretty dark. There's one little like postage stamp of light. So pretty dark. Not all is dark. Take courage, Lord of the Mark. For better help you will not find. No counsel have I to give to those that despair. Yet counsel I could give and words I could speak to you. Will you hear them? They're not for all ears. In other words, I don't want warm tongue to hear what I have to say. Okay? Come out before your doors and look abroad. Too long have you sat in shadows and trusted to twisted tales and crooked promptings. <coughs> Why the emphasis on twisted tales? Warm tongue's a bad counselor. He's a liar. Okay? But why doesn't he say bad counsel? He doesn't want to outright insult. Now, I don't think he cares about insulting Worm Tongue. <laughs> bad counsel could be more of mis misguided or misinformed, but twisted would imply it's intentionally incorrect. Okay, and what's the word that comes after twisted? Tales. You've been listening to bad stories. Wrong stories. He's saying... I could tell you good stories. I could tell you right stories. He's not talking. I could tell you great nonfiction facts. He's saying, Dayton, I could weave a story for you that if you would listen to me, it would do what? Take courage. What's going to happen here? The core of courage, the heart. It will inflame your heart. It will build your heart. It will increase your heart. What happens to the Grinch on Christmas morning when he rides up to the top of Mount Crumpet and hears the little Who's come out in Whoville Christmas morning and all their gifts and presents and meat and everything is gone. They still come out and sing. Why is that important? Because the Grinch learns from that story maybe it's not about stuff. And what happens to him? His heart grows. Okay? It's the same idea that Tolkien is doing here. And we're told, notice, merely because of words, Theoden gets up. Okay? And a faint light grows in the hall again. So is this Theoden starts to rise, and Gandalf goes, cue the lights, slowly, slowly, slow fade. Why does it start to get light in the hall? Because Theoden gets up. Theoden, we're being told, Theoden is the source of light. The reason it's dark, the reason it's been dark, because his mind has been darkened. And now, recovery, he's starting to see clearly. A faint light grew in the hall again. The woman hastened. Eowyn runs to his side, taking his arm. And with faltering steps, the old man came down from the dais and paced softly through the hall. That's not, he's taking mighty strides. He's doing what? <laughs> With Eowyn there holding his elbow. <clears throat> Wormtongue remains lying on the floor. They come to the doors and Gandalf knocks and cries open the doors. And the door warden standing outside throws open both doors. So obviously a couple things happen at that point. A lot of light streams in from outside. What else? What comes with the light? Fresh air. Fresh air. The fairy story I say, Tolkien uses the language in talking about recovery of cleaning the cobwebs. 
The doors roll back and a keen air came whistling in. What's meant by keen? Sharp. Sharp. Cold. It hit, and you immediately go, wow, that's cold. That's brisk, man. Gandalf says, send your guards down. They do. And he tells Eowyn, leave him with me. And Eowyn says, go, Eowyn's sister daughter. She turns, she goes back down. She looks back. Grave and thoughtful was her glance as she looked on the king with cruel pity in her eyes. Fair was her face, and long hair was like a river of gold. Blonde. Slender and tall she was in her white robe, girt with silver, Aryan, you know. Um, strong she seemed, stern as steel, a daughter of kings. Thus, Aragorn, for the first time in the full light of day, beheld Eowyn, Lady of Rowan, <coughs> and thought her fair, fair and cold, like a morning of pale spring that has not yet come to womanhood. And she's now suddenly aware of him and goes, hot damn. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> Tall heir of kings, wise with many winters, gray cloaked, hiding a power that yet she felt. And for a moment, still as stone, she stood. Still as stone. What word do we have in English that means that, literally? Nope. Astonished. Astonished means to be turned to stone. The stone in the middle of it. Okay, and the ston in the middle of it, that's the old English pronunciation of that word, which is spelled like that. So if you know somebody named Stan, their name means stone, rock, okay? So, Gandalf says, look out upon your land and look at the description we get. This, we are told, is what Theoden sees. From the porch upon the roof, the top of the high terrace, they could see beyond the stream the green fields of Rowan fading into distant gray. Curtains of wind blown rain were slanting down. The sky above and to the west was still dark with thunder, and lightning far away flickered among the tops of hidden hills. But the wind, okay, so what was, what's over there in the west? West and north. That's where Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli came from. The Immin Mule that they had to partially come through, and even farther west and north of that, Lothlorien. Right? But the wind had shifted to the north, and already the storm that had come out of the east, so he's looking down, right? the storm that had come out of the east, meaning Mordor, was receding. It's like it's being pushed back. This is a mini, M-I-N-I, -I, eucatastrophe. It's a little eucatastrophe. What is it showing us? Sauron won't win forever. Even the natural world is pushing back. Suddenly, notice this, through a rent in the clouds behind them. So they're standing here, the clouds up here, and back up here, the clouds part. And so the clouds part, we have this happen all the time in Murfreesboro, and what do you see? Boom, a shaft of light shines down. And a shaft of sun stabbed down. The falling showers, because you can still see the rain through, do what? They gleamed like silver. Notice, what does the silver kind of come through, come from? It comes from the shaft of light. Where does the shaft of light come from? If you read the Tolkien essay, he says, the, the good, happy ending, the good turn, it is like a glimpse of joy from beyond the confines of the world. That's what this is. It's telling us there's more at work than what we see. And if we read the Silmarillion, or if we read this in the light of the Silmarillion, it's kind of like maybe over there in Valinor, Manwe, the king of the gods, who is also like the Greek and Roman version, the king of the air, the king of clouds, the king of weather, 
Maybe he's kind of going, let's give him a little encouragement. Let's, let's give him a little, a little sign of hope. The falling shower gleamed like silver, and far away the river glittered like a shimmering glass. It'd be pretty hard to see this and not, be, not go, right? Well, that's the very description Tolkien says the Eucatastrophe does. It gives a momentary lifting of the heart. And what does they even say? It's not so dark here. What's the here? Is it here? Or is it here? He's now seeing as he is supposed to see. And because he sees the way he's supposed to see, we see the way he's supposed to see, the way we're supposed to see. Gandalf, no, it's not. <clears throat> Nor does age lie so heavily on your shoulders as some would have you think. Cast aside your problem. Get rid of the crutch, man. You're in your mid-50s. You don't need a stick. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> what does Peter Jackson do for this whole scene? It's like a duel with like a wizard. And he uses staff and maybe like his eyes clear out. And the king stands up and tosses Griffin out of the stairs. Well, it's Gandalf technically like removes Sauron from inside. Because Theoden in Peter Jackson's utterly abysmal mentality is possessed, mm -hmm. literally, demonically possessed by Saruman. So Gandalf points his staff at him and goes, in the name of whatever, I cast you out, you know. And we see Theoden kind of rail around and we see Saruman's face in Meanwhile, we go back to Saruman for a moment, and we see Saruman up there on the Orthanc. And then we go back, and we see, and Gandalf dispossesses him. Or, oh, let's use that good Catholic term, he exorcises him out. No. No, that's too simplistic. It's not demonic possession. It's what? It's ideological possession. It's being possessed of an idea. And even then it's not possession. Take two children. Two years old. Okay? Same children. Two years old. Put one in a family where that child is told from age 2 to age 15, you are wonderful. You are loved. You are valuable. You are important. You can do whatever you want. Repeatedly from 2 to 15, Take the other child put the, and, and give them books and give them music and give them a good education, the whole nine yards. Take the other one and do just the opposite. You are worthless. You're a sorry piece of, you know what? You will never amount to anything. You are a plague on my life. I would be better if I never had you. You are nothing but don't give them any books. Don't give them any music. Don't give them any opportunities. How are the two children going to be at 15? This one is going to have the world at his or her feet. This one is going to kill whoever he or she comes in contact with. Why? Because the story they've been told shapes who they become. Does it mean that they can't change? No, it doesn't. They can change. Okay? We see Theoden change here. How long has he been fed this nonsense by Theoden? By word tongue. We're not told literally, but the implication is it's a long time. He's been going. <laughs> what are the, and I don't care your politics. Politics don't matter. But I heard one, one really good thing. I read one really good thing yesterday by one of the Republicans in the Senate who said this about Trump and the impeachment, the Ukraine thing. He said he got really bad advice at first, and then he did what? And he followed it. Tell, tell me what you can find out about Biden, et cetera, et cetera. And he followed that, and then what? And then he got better advice. What was the better advice? Release the aid. Give up on the investigation. Release the aid. So, followed the bad advice at first, and then took better advice. It's competing narratives, competing stories. 
Okay? So, he drops the staff. And he does what? He drew himself up. That is, he stood upright, threw his chest out, as a man that is stiff from long bending over some dull toil. Dark have been my dreams of late, but I feel as one new awakened. There's the recovery. I would now. Would there means I wished, I desired. That you came before Gandalf. Now what could Gandalf do at this point? If Gandalf were Trump, let me put it this way. What would he do? I did come before you, dirty round SOB. I did tell you before. When I got when I took Shadow Fence, I told you then. This is what's gonna happen. But no, you wouldn't listen to me. No, you call me Gandalf Storm Pro. You call me Gandalf Bearer of Bad News. I'm just the bearer of news. I'm not the news maker. Okay? But Gandalf doesn't do that. He says, I wish you'd come before. Why? I think it's too late. I fear now it's already too late. It's almost like he starts to go. Gandalf, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Not long now shall stand the high hall, which Brago, son of Errol, built. Fire, fire shall devour the high seat. What is to be done? In other words, we're all going to die. Gandalf, what can be done? Much. We're going to take on Sauron. We're going to go conquer the world. No, nope. what does he say? Much. After that. Um, first step. First step. Notice the important thing there is step. It's the first thing to be done. What's the first thing to be done? Free Elmer, because you got him locked up. That's the first thing you should do. Well, no, he rebelled against my, you know, he wasn't rebelling against your commands. He didn't like one time. So let him go. And then after that, which they do, uh, you need a sword. Why does he need a sword? Hello? Warrior? You're a warrior. Okay, let's update it. You're a soldier. What do you need? You need your weapon. Okay? One that shoots a lot of rounds really fast, you know. A bear at M50, you know, kind of a thing. So, they do. They release Aomer. Aomer hands him his sword. That is, I'm yours to command. Like, I'm your gun now. We're going to hear conversation where essentially Sarah Man's going to say, shut up, Amir, you're just a gun. You're just a weapon. You kill what your Lord tells you to kill. That's it. Okay? So, Aomer lays his sword at his feet. He picks it up. He welcomes Aomer back. He takes that sword and he swings it in the air and he cries, arise, arise. And they're like, yay, Theta's back. Oh, crap, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Hama then comes and brings him his own sword. His, not Hama's, Theoden's sword. And notice it has a name. Herugrim. That means grim war. Well, that's a good name for a sword. It's like badass. Okay. So they give. Worm tongue, a choice. What's his choice? He says, I'm loyal to you, man. Okay, prove it. Ride into battle with me. He's like, okay, what's my second option? <laughs> or you can go to Sarah Man, your master. See ya. <laughs> he spits it at him in the face and he flees. Okay? So. Very next chapter, Helm's Deep. Okay? It's pages 526 to 542. The chapter is 16 pages. The battle itself is nine pages of the entire The Two Towers, <coughs> which is. Which is. 413 to 
742. So 329 pages. And the Battle of Helm's Deep is nine. In the film, it's somewhere between a fourth and a third of the entire film. That is the glorification of war. This is not. Okay? So we get the Battle of Helm's Deep. What happens? There's a battle. It's at Helm's Deep. Who wins? The good guys. <laughs> okay. Do we have dwarf tossing? Uh, no. In the film, we get dwarf tossing. Why? Because it's fun to toss dwarves? <sighs> no. Because it needs some comic relief? No. Because they thought it would be fun to toss Gimli. You know the character of Gimli, right? What do you think Gimli's going to do? Jared comes up and says, Gimli, let me toss you. You're dead, man. Yeah, you are a meat meat. Okay? Not going to happen. So, we get the competition between Gimli and Legolas. And what gets cemented in this chapter between Gimli and Legolas? Cemented, glued together. Friendship. Their friendship. At the end. Gimli's gone all the way back into the caves because they have to try to plug the hole. And he's like, oh man, you ought to see this. Legless and Legless are like, really? Rock and dirt and stone. I'd like to be out in the trees. Well, they've been in the trees, right? Which trees have they been in? Trees of Fangorn. What kind of forest is Fangorn? What kind of tree is Fangorn? A walking, talking tree. Okay. Tolkien doesn't invent that idea, by the way. That's old. You, you see that in some ancient Greek literature. Trees that move. He makes it really cool. <laughs> okay. I don't know about. I don't know what the biggest tree is you've ever seen. Like I said, I've grown, grew up in California. Used to go hiking in the redwoods. You go up to Big Old Red. You ever see the General Sherman tree? And the General Sherman tree, I don't know what the exact width of this classroom is, but it's like 25 feet in diameter. Not a round, diameter. I think this is about 30 by 30. So, from that wall to here, and then you look up it and you can't see the top. Big stinking tree. Imagine it walking. I'm going to stay away from this tree. Okay, I mean, it, yeah. Or a big old live oak somewhere. Imagine it. Okay. And Legos was like, oh, you gotta see the trees. And Gimli's like, let me sharpen my axe, you know. <laughs> so they make they come up with an agreement. If they live through all this, Legolas will go with Gimli into the caves of Helm's Deep, and Gimli will go with Legolas into Fangor. And that's, you know, probably easier for Legolas to go into caves than it is for Gimli to go into Fangorn. Okay? So, Gandalf comes back. The White Rider comes back with Urkenbrand and stuff. Cavalry, you know, and the day is saved. And we get the road to Isengard. And they make their way to Isengard. And what do the trees, some of them, the Hjorns, do with the piles of dead orcs. They're like natural recyclers. They move over them and then they're gone. <laughs> Eat them, bury them, whatever, but the orcs are gone. Okay? Yeah, I don't think it's just decomposed. I think it's a little bit more than that. So, they make their way to Isengard. And what do we see just outside <coughs> Eisenhard? I mean, literally where the wall used to be around Eisenhard. It's gone. But they ride up, and they see these figures there, and there's smoke coming from them. And everyone leaves us and you're like, what the? Because there's Mary and Pippin. And if you, you know, what Tolkien does is at the end of the Fellowship of the Ring, what do we see? We see Frodo and Sam. They're going off to Mordor, right? Mm -hmm. 
They're alone. Boromir, he's dead. Okay. Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, Alg, if you want. They go off chasing. Mary and Pippin. Mary and who've been carried by the orcs. So, the breaking of the fellowship? Yeah, it's the obliteration of the fellowship. Okay? So we pick up with the two towers, and where are we? We're back with Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, but Gormir's not dead yet. Okay? But he's going to be very soon. They bury him. They go off chasing. Merry and Pippin. We see Merry. So we kind of go back and forth a little bit. Then they meet up with Gandalf. He comes back. And we stay with them for a while. Now we get reintroduced to Merry and Pippin. Meanwhile, where are Frodo and Sam? We don't know. They just jumped in the boat. And where we're going to pick up? They're jumping in the boat. At the beginning of the next book. Okay. So, Flotsam and Jetsam. We get kind of the repair of part of the fellowship. Boy, I don't want to burst any bubbles, but Boromir doesn't come back. <laughs> as, as Dumbledore says to Sirius, no spell can reawaken. He's dead. He's going to stay dead. Okay. Gandalf got to come back. Yeah, a little bit different. So, they see Mary and Pippin, and Mary and Pippin explains what ha explain what happened. Okay? So we're going to skip Flotsam and Jetsam, and they share their pipe weed, or weed if you want. <laughs> <coughs> and we get chapter 10, The Voice of Ceremony. 10.30, so 25 minutes. Voice of Ceremony. So Gandalf says, we need to go talk to Sarah. Where is Sarah? He's in the tower of Orthanc. It's Old English, or means beginning, or origins. Origins. Thunk means thought. Kind of like the beginning of thought. You know? Pretty lofty name. By the way, what is the title of the novel? of the, the second volume referred to, the two towers. What are the two towers? I once had a student who said, they shouldn't make a book about the two towers because the idiot thought it meant like the twin towers. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bright one. Not a bright one there. What are the two towers? I've seen two different explanations. I've seen the unification of Red Earth and Orthlon. I've also seen someone argue that it's Minas Tirith the division between Minas Tirith and Minas, uh, Minas Morgul. Okay, so you have Orthanc, which is a tower. Barad, Barad, Dur, Sauron's tower, which is a tower. You have Minas Tirith, the tower of Gondor, and then you have Minas Morgul. Which is the Tower of um, Yeah, it's the Tower of Sorcery. Uh, it's the tower just outside Kirith Ungol. Okay. Which of those do we actually see in the novel? Do we see, do we spend any time at Baradur? No, not really. We get reference to Sauron. Frodo puts the ring on an on him. He sees the eye, but not really the tower. Do we spend much time in Minas Tirith? No. Beginning of the third volume, we do, because we see Gandalf and Pippin arrive at Minas Tirith. So it's probably not that. We do see this some, and we do see this some. I kind of think it's those two. Okay? Tolkien never says specifically. So, voice of ceremony. <coughs> Gandalf says, we need to go talk to Saruman. Pippin's like, so what's the big deal, man? I mean, what's the deal? Will he shoot at us, pour fire out of the windows, or can he put a spell on us from the distance? Gandalf says, the last is most likely. Okay, Who's going to come with him? That is, who's going to come up? Because Minas Tirith you know, kind of looks like this. It's got a stairway that goes up, and then there's like a little platform here and a little platform here. Who's going to come up to the platform? With Gandalf. Aragorn, because it concerns him. And Gimli says, I'm coming too. I gotta represent us dwarves, you know. And he's like, okay, but because Gimli wants to know what? 
Does he really look like yeah, you? Does he look like you? Or vice versa. And Gandalf's like, how are you going to know? If he wants to look like me, he will look like me. <laughs> this is the Gandalf you believe in. <laughs> okay. Theoden concerns him. So, they come now, and Gandalf says, I'm going up because I've been in it, and I'm not afraid anymore. Why is he not afraid? He's a little white. <laughs> he thinks he's white, and he ain't white anymore. Okay? So, Gandalf says, you know who the others are, and they go up, and Gandalf says, Sarah Man, notice, Sarah Man come forth. You ever heard, read a passage of anybody who says anything like that, but not Sarah Man? Another name? Lazarus, come forth. It's what Jesus says when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Okay? There's no answer, and then finally they hear a voice. Who is it? What do you wish? Shut up. Go get Sarah Man. So Sarah Man comes out. And we get a description. I'm not going to read all of the description, but we get a description. He comes out. He speaks. They expect this harsh, uncouth voice, and instead it's like liquid silver. I mean... I don't know if you've ever heard a <coughs> singer from the 50s, 40s, 50s, very, very early 60s, Nat King Cole. It's like just, I mean, smooth chocolate, right? Well, why must you disturb my rest? Will you give me no peace at all by night or day? Its tone was that of a kindly heart aggrieved. They look up, they're astonished, because they didn't hear him coming. His face was long, and Gimli goes, like, yeah, I'm like. But the voice says, okay, <coughs> two of you I know. Here's Gandalf, here's Theoden. So, two of you I know. What does that therefore mean? I don't know the others. And yet, we're going to see he does know who the others are. Is it because, like, Theoden goes, uh, Wormtongue goes, uh, the little short, stumpy one, that's Gimli, son of Gloin. You remember him from Hobbit, right? Uh, and let's see. The other one there with the kind of pointy helmet, that's Aelmer. He's Theoden's nephew. Okay. No. So he addresses Theoden. Yeah. What's he say? It's on his big branch just about there. Cool. So what's he say? He addresses Theoden. What does he ask him? Will we have peace? What's he mean by that? Wizards, powerful. You gotta have peace. If they're not gonna have peace, you're gonna get what's coming. So he asks all this, and everybody looks up, and Gimli says, Words of this wizard stand on their heads, and the language of Orthanc help means ruin. In other words, Gimli's been reading 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> Strength, or, um, Love is hate. War is peace. Tolkien writes this before 1984. <laughs> In the language of Orthanc, help means ruin. Saving means slain. That is plain. We do not come here to beg. Ceremony. Peace! And he catches himself. I do not speak to you yet, Gimli Glowing. Oh, so he does know him. Gimli Glowing Son. Far away is your home. Small concern of yours are the troubles of this land. Not by design of your own that you became embroiled in them. And I'm sure you played a brave and honorable part, you know. Like, no. what are you doing? Yeah, shut up. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> so he addresses Theoden again. What have you to say, Theoden King? Will you have peace with me and all the aid that my knowledge founded in long years to bring? Okay. Still Theoden doesn't answer. Aylmer speaks. Listen to Aylmer. Have we ridden forth to victory only to stand at last amazed by an old liar with honey on his forked tongue? So the trapped wolf speaks to the hounds if he could. What aid can be given to you forsooth? All he desires is to escape from his plight. Will you parley with this dealer in treachery and murder? And I kind of think, and I could be wrong, <coughs> that when Ilmer says all that, all Theoden hears is wah, 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 like in the Charlie Brown things and the teacher speaks. Probably what many of you are hearing. <laughs> and what Theoden hears is the next line. 
Remember Theodred at the Fords and the grave of Hama in Helm's Deep. Well, who's Theodred? Theodred's son. <coughs> at the Fords, that's when Theodred was sent to help protect, defend a little hamlet. And Saruman's forces rode through and killed them all, women and children. Okay? Remember him, and remember Hama. And how, what happened to Hama? He was the door warden, right? He guarded the weapons when people came. Well, he was killed at Helm's Deep, and then what? They hacked his body to pieces. See, even in this pagan world, there's an idea. When your enemy dies, you respect the body. There's this idea of honor, of nobility. You don't desecrate the body. And he says, remember Hama. If we speak a poison tongue, which shall we say of yours, young serpent? And he goes, oops, sorry, didn't mean to say that. Amir, Amir, yours is glory in battle. You're a gun. You shoot what your Lord commanded you to shoot. You're not a diplomat. You don't have to think of high and mighty things. What's he essentially saying? You don't know what you're talking you're about. You're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. You're a moron. You're broad. You know, let's go pop iron. You know. That's it. You're Conan. But my lord of Rowan, am I to be called a murderer? And what does he do? He brings in what's called moral equivalency. Mm. Okay. The refuge of scoundrels, I would say. He says, if I'm a murderer, then so are you. Why? Be I'm a murderer because I engaged in war? Well, so did you. Therefore, we're all murderers. That's the moral equivalency he's trying to draw. Why doesn't it work? Because Theoden didn't attack. You attacked me. Because I defended myself, therefore I'm a murderer? Uh-uh. Not how it works. That's not how it works. And Theoden finally says, We will have peace. And several writers go, Yes, we gotta go home. Finally. We will have peace. When you and all your works have perished and the works of your dark master to whom you would deliver us. I look at you and I see merely one finger or one claw on the hand of Sauron. You're nobody. Talk about a tool. Hmm. Well, you gotta put yourself in Saruman's shoes. He thought, I'm gonna become Sauron. <laughs> right? He says, we will have peace. Only when you hang from a gibbet at your window for the sport of crows. When you hang from your neck. Because you know what they did with outlaws? You know, he can go all the way up to Elizabethan England. You know, if somebody committed a capital crime, you hang them and then what? You let them hang until the body rots. So birds come and peck the eyes out. They pick the soft flesh up, and then the body falls, and then you let the dogs get them. You don't bury it at all. That's when we'll have peace, sir, man. And they're like, the writers, what the hell? <laughs> I like that first part. Of the yeah, I like the second. first part. Eh? Gibbets and crows, and now notice how he dresses them. Before he called them brave, the beautiful visage of the house of Errol. Now, dotard, what is the house of Arrow but a thatched barn where brigands drink in the reek? That's a pretty apt description of an Anglo-Saxon hall. They drink in the reek. They're not paved floors, they're dirt floors. You have your cows and pigs in with you, okay, for most of them. And then he addresses Gandalf. Gandalf, how can you stand to hang around with riffraff? And everybody down below listens, and we're told, bottom of 581. 
So great was the power that Sarah man exerted in his last effort that none that stood within hearing were unmoved. Okay, now, who does the none include? Gandalf. That is, even Gandalf's life. What? 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 what was that? What did you say? But now the spell was wholly different. They heard the gentle remonstrance of a kindly king with an erring but much-loved minister. And they think everybody but Gandalf thinks Gandalf's going to go up, the door's going to get closed, and we're all dead. And then Gandalf laughs. Sarah man, Sarah man, you missed your path in life. You should have been the king's jester. I am beyond your comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Gimli said Galadriel was to Eomer. Well, what does Gandalf mean? I'm beyond your comprehension. Well, Sarah Man still thinks he's great, eh? Exactly. Sarah Man still thinks he's Gandalf the Great, and he is Sarah Man of many colors, right? Why is that significant? And Gandalf says, I am beyond your comprehension. What does Gandalf mean when he says, for example, I'm Gandalf the White? Whole different person. Actually, whole different level of being. Whole, he's, he, if, if you want to think evolutionary chain, he's gone from this level, not to this level, he's gone from this level to this level. Okay? I mentioned the other day the, the, you know, the difference between the East and the Western church and the understanding of original sin and, and ancestral sin. In that same kind of mind frame, you know, in the in Genesis, it says, God says, let us make him, Adam, let us make him in our image and the likeness. So, and then we're told, therefore, in their image and likeness, in his image and likeness was Adam made. Okay? In the Eastern Church, they take that phrase, image and likeness, to be two distinct things. In the Western church, they're synonyms. Likeness is just another way, another word for, for image. In the Eastern church, being made in the image of God is being made with free will choice. The likeness is something that has to be developed. That is something that comes as a result of the right practice of free will. Well, how do you test the will? Here's a tree. Don't eat. That's it. Simple choice. Simple test of obedience. If you do, you're going to die. Notice what is not said. If you don't eat of it, well, the Eastern Church and the Eastern Fathers said, what that meant was, if you don't eat of it, then you will attain the likeness. And what's the likeness? The image of Christ, so to speak. Okay? That is, you will rise up into a whole other level of being. Well, Gandalf kind of does that. Okay? So, I'm beyond your comfort. You can't even think of what I am. And he's like, servant's like, what are you talking about? You're Gandalf the Grey. I beat your sorry, you know what? <laughs> I had you in prison up here. That damn eagle came and rescued you again. You know? So, Gandalf says, Will you come down? Will you turn from your plots? Will you turn from your machinations? Will you, what's another word? Repent. Because re, what does repent literally mean? It means to turn away from, to turn around. It's like literally, if I were to start walking and just keep walking, what am I going to do? I'm going to hit that wall, so I better repent. The closer I get to the wall, the sooner I've got to repent. Otherwise, wham! It just means do a 180. That's what he's asking. Them. How many times does Gandalf give Sarah Man a, a chance to repent? He does several times in the course of the novel. He keeps giving him opportunities to change, but he doesn't. He doesn't. Okay? So... Gandalf says, I'm giving you a last chance. Bottom of page 582. 
You can leave Worthing now free. Free. No strings attached. Well, there are strings attached. What are the two strings? you got to give me the key and your staff. Those two things. And if you behave, you'll get the staff back. Yeah, I like that. So, Sarah Man leaves. What did Gandalf do? No, 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 no. I am not done with you yet. Sarah Man, come back. And he's like, he feels something pull him. Now, put yourself in Sarah Man's shoes at that point. What three words are going through your mind? What? No, 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 no. Okay? I did not give you leave to go, page 583. I have not finished. You have become a fool. There's that word again that Gandalf just loves. And a and pitiable. Notice. And yet, you can still be pitied. You might still have turned away from falling evil and have been of service. So he says, behold, I'm not Gandalf the Grey. Surprise! And he flashes him. Oh, no. <laughs> My eyes. I am Gandalf the White, who has returned. And if it was unclear before, he makes it exquisitely clear here. And have returned from death. I was dead and am alive again. You have no color now. That is, you are no longer an Istari. You are no longer a wizard. Your power's gone. Except for one. What power does he still have? And it's a power every person in this room has. His voice. His voice. He can still do what? He can still tell stories. False stories, true. But stories. You're cast from the order and from the council. And he breaks his staff. Worm tongue throws something out. We find out later what it is. Okay. So, page 585. Pippin runs and picks it up. And Gandalf says, give it to me. Notice, Gandalf knows immediately what it is. 585. Pippin asks, and what if Sauron does not conquer? That is, if Sauron doesn't win, if we win, what are you going to do to Saruman? Come on, Gandalf, tell us the end of the story. Nothing. I, I will do nothing to him. I do not wish for mastery. Remember what Tolkien said in the fairy story essay. What is mastery? That's the desire of the magician. What's it ultimately all about? Power. What's the theme of the course? The renunciation of power. Gandalf never, throughout the entire novel, seeks power. He never takes power from someone. What will become of him? I don't know. <coughs> he doesn't know what's going to become of Gollum. Okay? So, chapter 11, or is it 2? 11, the Palantir. A few more minutes before I do give you the quiz. What happens with the Palantir? What's a modern English word for Palantir? Close, that's two words. I'm thinking one word. Everyone has one. You all have one. Television. Long sight. That's all Palantir means. Okay. Oddly enough, there's a company in Silicon Valley called Palantir. It's scary as all hell. <laughs> it's data crunching and all that kind of stuff, okay? So, because Pippin picked it up, he's got itchy fingers. So Gandalf goes to sleep with it, tucked under his arm. Pippin comes and takes it, and he looks at it. What's he see? Sauron. Who does Sauron think he is? Frodo. He thinks Saruman has Frodo, and therefore, the ring. So, Gandalf has to separate Pippin from the Palantir. How? You and I are going on the horseback ride. They're going to go off to Minas Tirith. The Palantir is going to stay with Aragorn. Why with Aragorn? Exactly. They were made by the kings of Numenor slash Westernessa 
to communicate television over long distances. There were seven of them, if I remember correctly. Okay? We're going to see another one later. Maybe on Tuesday. Okay? Probably Thursday. All right? So, he leaves it with Aragorn. He tells Aragorn to be careful with it. Don't be rash or hasty. Aragorn's like, come on, man. When have I been rash or hasty? He's like, never, but just don't. Okay? <laughs> don't start and we're going to find out what Aragorn, later, we're going to find out what Aragorn does with it. Jump, jump forward. What does Aragorn do? He looks in it. Why? To challenge Sauron. Why does he do this, though? I mean, isn't this kind of a stupid thing to do? I mean, Sauron's a Maya. Aragorn's that. But Aragorn thinks what about the Palantir? It's mine. I am the rightful owner of not only this Palantir, but all Palantir. E. Okay? And he says, he's going to tell us, and I rested it to my will, which means I made Sauron watch the channel I wanted him to watch. I have provoked. And that channel was me. Me how? Strider. Uh -uh. How did Sauron see Aragorn? The once and future king. He saw Elendil, Isildur, dot, dot, dot. Aragorn. And what else did he see? Remember this? Hmm. Yeah, that finger you're missing? It's back. I'm coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all your children, too, you know. Okay. We'll stop there. So we didn't get as far as I needed to. So we will pick up with chapter one of book four. Uh, Taming of Smeagol. Book the next one. So put everything away.